fractional nested data. Uh, so typically with this type of data, we're looking at the classic example is going to be like classes nested within schools. We have multiple schools and then you have classes within that. And the idea is that individual students within each classroom, they can be more similar to each other than across classrooms. Uh, so that's kind of the idea within this. Um, the nice thing within multi-level modeling is it's it's fun. It's just regression. So it's not it's not anything really massive within this. We're just we're partitioning things out. We're partitioning out our coefficients at both the school level and at the classroom level. And you can think of this as maybe it's at if we're looking at an organization, it could be at the department level, then individuals within that department. And you can look at it in tons of different ways. Now, again, it's going to be cross-sectional. So it's only a single time point. If you're doing multiple time points, then we get into what I like to call the really fun stuff. Because now we're talking about longitudinal designs. We're talking about um, like maybe it's daily diary work. So it can get really fun. And where there'll be a whole separate workshop uh, in a couple of months on longitudinal multi-level modeling. We'll talk about how to work with correlated errors, how to work with the type of data and all lots of lots of fun stuff. So this is really great. And I realized I went ahead and just started talking about multi-level modeling. As you can probably tell, I'm excited to talk about multi-level modeling. I love this stuff. Um, but the I'm my name is Eric Schuler. I work at Center for Teaching Research and Learning. I'm the senior quantitative and computational research methodologist. And I'm here to support faculty-led research. So um, if you have questions about your data, about type, what type of analysis, um, what type of how to code this within R or other programs, I'm here to help out. Uh, so that's kind of my role here within CTRL. So what we're going to do now is let me go ahead and I'm going to repaste this one more time uh, just for those who are, um, who are just joining. This is a link to the R code for the for today's session. It's heavily annotated. It is a, a QMD file, so it's really good for like um, for teaching with. It's not computationally efficient though, so if you were to toss this on the high performance computer, it would not be very happy. Um, it's because that's, I really wouldn't recommend that. But what we're gonna do now is kind of, just, we're gonna have a conversation about multi-level modeling. I'm gonna show you some tricks and some different things of setting stuff up and how I would go about doing that. Uh, for transparency, uh, my background is in, I'm an experimental psychologist by training. However, my area of research and I'm more closely aligned to educational psychology and most specifically psychometrics. So that's kind of the lens I typically view stuff on. So this will be a different lens than say an econometrician or someone who does uh, different types of analysis, different ways of looking at nest and nest data. Uh, so this is coming at it from an educational psychology perspective. So I just want to mention that and just close that. The, um, there's also different camps for multi-level modeling. Uh, full, dis full disclosure, I'm in the camp that if you have nested data, you better run multi-level modeling. Um, that's just how I was trained, and that's how I view nestedness. Uh, there's different camps where you could pool the standard errors. You don't necessarily have to do multi-level modeling. Um, and if it's really low ICCs or interclass correlation coefficient, which we'll talk about a little bit, um, that you don't necessarily have to do multi-level. That's overkill. Again, different camps have different opinions on these things, um, and that's perfectly okay. Uh, but I also talk you to some things that if things are getting really weird with your data, they're not working right, there's always alternatives. So just because I'm going doing it this way, there's other approaches, that's okay. Um, so I am assuming some uh, basic, information, or basic knowledge of R. Uh, so if you're new to R, welcome. Good to have you aboard. Um, and there's some fantastic videos I've done, and I actually have a whole Canvas site that's just how to learn to use R. So if you're interested, send me an email, let me know, I can add you. Always happy to talk about R. So for today, we're going to talk about what exactly is multi-level modeling. We're going to talk about, well, how do we assess whether multi-level modeling is needed? I'm going to walk through how to run some basic two-level, multi-level models, how to calculate effect sizes, and then how to check assumptions, and then how to get that nice output into a nice publication-ready table, just to save yourself time because no one has time to do this by hand. And honestly, don't do it by hand. Never do it by hand because you're gonna you're more prone to make a mistake. So I also want to disclose that this is an adaption of an LME4 tutorial 
by Lorette Smith and Renz van der Schoot. Uh, there's a link to their website there. It's um, a fantastic resource. So if you're interested, I highly recommend it. Uh, that's where I kind of took this and I developed and added stuff from the, or since then onto it and some different different features and different ways of looking at it. But again, full disclosure, that's where the data set's coming from and that's where the basic architecture for this workshop's coming from. Uh, so first thing we're going to do is we got to make sure that our, our session is ready to go with this. Um, if it's not, then we're going to have some issues. Let me go ahead and paste uh, the link to the script again. Uh, so this is, you know, it's nice within this, you don't have to have a data set within it. Um, I've coded this in where it's going to be pulling the data off or is pull, uh, from the internet, so you don't have to have a copy of it locally. Um, you just have to have the script. Uh, so for this one, this is a, a quick cheater code. So by all means, take it, run with it if you want. What this does is I have a list of packages we'll be using today. And if it's not installed on my computer, it's going to go ahead and install it for me. I use a setup uh, for my own research. That way I'm not having to reinstall everything each and every time. It just gives it a scan and, hey, if I'm missing it, it's going to go ahead and install. Um, this might be might take a little bit more time if you're installing packages you haven't used before. Um, but once you've installed them, it's like a light switch. You're good to go for a while. And this is a major update. So um, while we're waiting for this, well, potentially if you're running this in parallel while watching this, awesome. If you want to just follow along and try this later on your own, awesome too. Um, but quick question for you all. Um, have you worked or have any of you worked with uh, nested data before? Have experience with multi-level modeling? Uh, so be, feel free to go ahead and mention in the chat. I'd love to just kind of hear more. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, I'm seeing some no, so that's that's perfectly okay. This is a, again, this is a primer. So if you have experience, awesome. If not, don't worry about it. Uh, and there's gonna be a whole bunch of additional information too at the bottom. So yes, but in SAS, yep, SAS is fantastic for multi-level modeling. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good program for that. Um, so if you're new to multi-level modeling, let me go ahead and a little bit of a spoiler. Uh, let me mention this early on. Way at the bottom of the script, there's a whole bunch of citations. So I'm a big fan. If I'm going to say something, I better have a citation to support it. So all these from the workshop, we'll talk about those later on, but resources, these are all fantastic multi-level modeling resources. Some of them from PSU, fantastic run-throughs. There is one I would highly recommend. It's from University of Bristol. They are Center for Multi-Level Modeling. They have a completely online free multi-level modeling course. It goes from the basics of regression all the way to really advanced multi-level models. Um, so you just have to create an account. It's completely free. It was funded through a bunch of grant work that they did. I've done it. It is just, it is really, really great. And it, taught, and it actually has different software. So if you're a SAS user, a Stata user, SPSS, R user, they have corresponding codes for all of it too. Uh, so it's a go as or kind of um, at your own pace. Oh, um, let's see. It's just a mess about audio problems. Let's see, is that better? Okay. All right. Um, hmm. Okay. I would probably maybe check your sound then on your side. Okay. Um, uh, while you're doing that, um, one other quick resource I want to mention too is I'm a big proponent of open, oops, open free resources. There is, I believe, a copy of this book at the AU Library. It's the first edition. Still really good. Uh, Multi-level modeling using R. This is the second edition. Um, let me go ahead and I will paste the link to this if you're interested in the second. I would check out the first one at the library first before you go out and purchase it personally. But 
I really liked it, so I picked up a personal copy. Um, a really good resource. It's all R specific. Um, if you're doing more like longitudinal work, there's a chapter on it, but it really, in in my mind, that's an entire textbook of all of itself. And there are textbooks just on intensive longitudinal designs for multi level modeling. Um, Again, just some resources, just in case anyone has to drop uh, drop off this at any point, no worries. Schedules completely get it. Uh, we are recording this as well, so be able to go back, watch it. I just want to make sure I mention those, those two important resources really quickly, though. Uh, so now that we have our environment set up, let's go ahead and we'll talk a little bit about the data and about some but what kind of what is multi-level modeling more broadly so it's really a method for regression the idea is that whenever our data is nested so it's like uh, children nested within classrooms or classrooms nested within schools whatever your unit of analysis is if you're at the individual level then you have that but there's a higher order structure that's nested um, so you could also have things like a daily responses to like a ecological momentary assessment where you give someone a survey every day, multiple times a day. Well, now you have responses nested within individuals and that's really cool stuff. That's really fun. Um, but the idea is that there's, if you don't account for this nested data structure, you can act, you're violating the independent observations assumption that regression has, and that's going to be an issue. Now, sometimes if like, especially cross-sectionally, if there's a low degree of nestedness, then it's okay. You, you don't, you're not as prone to have issues with your standard errors and issues with your coefficients within this. But if it's um, a fairly substantial degree of nestedness, then by not accounting for that, that is really going to have influence on your analyses. Uh, so you, the first step is always going to be, well, check, do you have to run multi-level modeling? And there's some recommendations, like um, if you have less than, like if you look at classes, and students within classes, if you have less than 10 classes or 10 level two, or you grouping variable, 10 levels of that or 10 groups, then it's going to have convergence issues. And that's just, it happens. If that happens, I go the route of Bayesian personally. I love Bayesian. It's, I throw Bayes at it. Uh, and that tends to work out. You have to have good priors for that, and that's a whole other conversation. But there's ways around convergence issues. Um, but the big thing is to to check, make sure you have adequate number of like students within each classroom and number of classrooms. And it, it's going to vary on a bunch of different factors. So I always recommend first, go try running multi-level first, see if it runs into convergence issues. If no convergence issues, awesome. And then check degree of nestedness. Um, there's different... Multi-level models, there's different terms. Each one's a little slightly different. So we have random coefficient model, variance component models, hierarchical linear models, mixed effects models. These are all different parts of multi-level modeling, but there's different aspects of it. But they all have a single outcome that's measured at the lowest level. So if your level, if your outcome is leveled at or measured at like the classroom level and you have individual level data but not an individual level outcome, that's going to be an issue. You're going to have to aggregate up. Um, so we're assuming that your outcome is at the, what we call level one, that's your lowest level. And then looking at level two predictors or level two information, or like the grouping level information. Uh, so it's important to note that all these models, the different ones I just mentioned, they're all slightly different. Uh, so we're just going to assume a basic two level regression model for now. The, um, this tutorial is actually also based on Jupe Hoax's book. Uh, you can get the SPSS file. We're going to get that off GitHub. Um, the nice thing is, too, fantastic book. He takes a model, a model building technique, which I really like. Uh, full disclosure, because this is existing data, this is only for educational and teaching purposes only. So I just want to mention that a quick disclaimer. So about the data set. So our data is, it's actually uh, fake data. So it's going to play nice. Uh, real data sometimes does not play nice, especially with multi-level modeling. But it's going to be that we have students nested within classrooms. So here we have uh, variables at the student level, or at what we call our level one. We also have classroom level or teacher level variables. There are 100 classrooms and approximately 20 students per classroom. The average class size is about 20 students, and that will come into play later on. So we're looking at this is called the popularity data. So this is, again, simulated data set. 
um, for a really simple example, multi-level regressions, we're looking at pupil popularity, a popularity score, which was between one and 10 for sociometric um, procedure. Um, it asks all pupils to rate all other pupils in the class and then sends an average popularity score rating for each student. Um, there are some group effects in there, high level variance components. Um, there's a second outcome variable we're not that's really by their student or by the teacher. We have uh, extroversion, we have pupil sex, we have teacher experience. Um, and we'll be looking at some different aspects within this as we build a complex model. We'll also be looking at interaction terms. So for what we're gonna do, we can look at popularity. And again, that's measured at our level one or our student level. We have student sex that's dummy coded. We also have student extroversion that's self-reported from one to 10. Higher scores mean higher levels of extroversion. So we're going to treat that as continuous. We also have teacher experience ranging from two to 25 years, and we'll be actually including an interaction term within there too to see are there differences based on it. So if we look at our equation, I always recommend writing out your equations uh, just because it makes it easier for writing out the code and for interpretations. So for here we have our notation of sub i, that's at the individual student. So i, it could be one, two, three, all the way up to 2000. The y i sub j, the j recommends, is actually representing the classroom from one to 100. We have our outcome variable, that's our y i sub j, and that's gonna be popularity. And that's a function of your person specific intercept, our b zero sub j, our class specific slope, that's our B1 sub J, um, X I sub J. And then we can kind of expand that out. We also have our within class uh, association of popularity and the residual error as well. So we can then break down our intercepts. So we have a class specific equation now. So we have our, this is our overall regression, but now we can break down our coefficients because we, we have a nested data structure. So our B zero sub I, our intercept, can then be broken down into gamma zero zero, that's the fixed effect average of class intercept, plus gamma sub zero one, which is used to represent the class differences in the specific intercept related to specific class differences. And we'll, we're gonna walk through this and kind of look at it. But essentially we're taking our, sorry, to taking our coefficients and we're breaking them down into the levels within this. And then we also have our uh, error variances as well within that, so random effect and residual of unexplained uh, differences in the intercepts. We also have our class-specific for class-specific slopes. So our B1 our, for our first variable, first predictor. Sub so I, we can break that down into gamma 1, 0. We have a fixed effect, and then we have class-specific differences within the slopes. So it's just, it's partitioning out our coefficients, and that's the idea of multi-level modeling within this. So we can take all of this and we can rewrite all of this into a really long equation. So rather than using um, our Bs, or if we had standardized, we'll just use the standard or unstandardized within this. That's we're not going to get into standardization within this. But if we break this down, we can then essentially expand our coefficients into the gammas within this, and really start looking at the variables. If we plug in our variable labels, we have our gamma zero zero. We have based on sex, extroversion experience. We have uh, gender, or sorry, uh, sex experience. We have an interaction within there, extroversion times experience as well. So we have some interaction terms within this. So we can then start actually running stuff. Um, the nice thing within R is we don't have to necessarily separate our level one, level two variables and write the equations like if it was a different software. Um, it kind of, based on the structure, it kind of knows, which is great. So first thing we want to do is let's pull on our data set. So we're going to pull in this from GitHub. Um, so there's our simulated data and as an SPSS file. And then essentially what we're gonna do now is we're just gonna subset the variables of interest. So we're only gonna keep what we really care about. So we're gonna get pupil, class, extroversion, sex, a teacher experience, and popularity. And then I'm gonna go ahead and run this chunk. And we're just making sure everything is numeric um, just to make it a lot easier for us. With it being with sex being dummy coded zero one, it can be as numeric. We don't have to factorize it because it's already binary. So it's good to go. Um, 
let's first take a quick look at descriptive statistics. So just seeing, making sure there's nothing in here that's going to be kind of standing out. Again, this is at the overall data set level, not the specific class levels. You can kind of just get a sense of the data. If you want to look at that by classroom, what I like to do is I use the describe by within the psych package. And we're going to group this by class. And then we're just creating a, a compact descriptive statistic table. Um, and then putting this out as an HTML. Now there's a good amount of classes here. So let me go ahead and pull this here so we can kind of let me move zoom out of the way. So for each group, group one is actually class. So class one, how many students? What's the mean standard deviation? This is just for the our outcome variable of popular. So we can get our descriptive statistics for all 100 classes for popularity. And that's again our how many students, our mean, standard deviation, median, skewness, kurtosis, and standard error of the mean. Um, realistically, you would not put this in a manuscript, maybe as an appendix, because that's a lot of information. But it's a quick way. I always like to double check the data, get a sense of it, and really understand what's going on here. Um, we can also look at just histograms, looking at what's the popularity scores look like in terms of the, the pattern. And this is ignoring the data structure itself. So we're gonna run this and take a look. And that looks pretty, that looks pretty good. Um, again, completely ignoring the multi-level structure. So that's that could be a problem later on too. We can then look at the relationship between extroversion and popularity. And again, just looking at the two variables of interest, ignoring the structure and say, okay, well, that. That looks like roughly positive, maybe. Again, ignoring the class structure within this. What we can also do then is let's take a look and see like, if we shade this by each classroom. So this is just using ggplot, and I'm just kind of creating an, a scatter plot here. But I'm going ahead and using the colors within this to then help create that gradient by class. So each class has its own color. We get a sense of what it looks like. I mean, there's so many classes in there, it's it's a mess. So again, with smaller class numbers, it makes it easier to work with. But let's say that you wanted to run a regression line and start visualizing, well, what do the different classrooms look like? Um, you could do that here. So again, um, X and Y scatter plot here, but we're superimposing regression lines uh, for each one. So we're doing that by class. And then it's gonna be a mess. My apologies, because there's 100 classes. Yeah, this is a bit of a mess. But for the most part, they all look like a positive regression line. Higher scores of extroversion are related to higher scores of popularity. I'm not really surprised there. Again, the simulated data. Would it be better option is to isolate this? Because 100 of these, it's, it's a mess. Trying to interpret that, I wouldn't do it. So what we do is we subset this. So by importing in our data line here within ggplot2, I'm just saying when class is less than or equal to 12. So it's going to be a smaller subset of the classrooms and then running that. The nice thing when you do that is we get for each, each of these is a separate classroom. So from 1 to 12, and we kind of see, well, what do these relationships look like? What is it? And it gives you a better sense. And you can actually copy and paste this out. So then just kind of view this for all 100 classes. Again, I'd like to take that extra time just to get a sense of the data, really understand what's going on with it before I start running analyses, just because if I then try to interpret the coefficients without really understanding the data, that's that's going to cause issues later on too. Um, so right now we just talked about like ignoring the multi-level structure, and just kind of some quick visuals. I do want to mention a really, really, really critical thing about multi-level modeling, and that's centering. Um, so in our example, we're not going to center the level one variables. However, centering is really important because it changes your interpretation of the results. And the decision of what type of centering you're doing depends on the nature of your research question. Uh, so within multi-level data, there's two primary ways to center. The first one is what's called cluster centering. So that means the individual responses of a variable is centered based on the mean of each cluster. So we would essentially take the class means. Uh, so that's one method. The other method is grand mean centering. So we take the centering based on the mean of the entire sample rather than the cluster mean, which is like each cluster 
has its own mean that we're subtracting the individuals or the individual score minus the cluster mean. So two different approaches, and that will give you different results. So it really depends on your question. Per cluster or group mean centering, that's when your question is focusing on the relationship of the independent variable on the dependent at your level one, or if your level one independent variable has interactions with another predictor. That's going to allow you unbiased estimates. Um, specifically, that new score captures the student score in relation to that room or that class or the classroom or the cluster. That's from the coach 2010. Um, so if that's your where your hypotheses are going, do cluster group mean stand or group mean centering. If you're looking at the influence of the independent variable at the level two or the grand mean centering or level one predictors, so you're trying to adjust for that influence. So similar to like in ANCOVA, I have strong feelings on ANCOVA. I am happy to go on a, a complete rant on it, but I won't do that for now. But I have strong feelings on ANCOVA. Um, but you essentially what you could do is if you do grand mean centering, you have uninterpretable mix of level one and level two relationships. Um, but you can then kind of start covering out that aspect of it. So it really depends on your specific question. I also know a bunch of multi-level modelers who don't center their data for cross-sectional. So it it really I feel like it's a cop-out, essentially, but from the psych discipline where we say, well, it depends, and this is a good case of it depends. Um, so before we get into the next aspect of, well, how do, we, how do I determine if I really need to do multi-level modeling with my data? I want to take a quick pause and then see if there's any questions so far. Um, if not, uh, just use the thumbs up icon and we'll continue. Uh, but if you have questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or if you want to unmute, Definitely, no problem. Um, just let me know. And as we're going through, if you have questions, feel free. I'll, I'll try to check on the chat as I'm going. Um, but if you have questions, um, just go ahead and unmute and let me know and happy to chat, happy to do that. Um, just because I, I know I, I don't want to miss anything in the chat and then move on to the next topic and then backtrack. That's never fun. But yeah, feel free to unmute if you have questions. Uh, it looks like no questions so far. Good to go. Okay, we'll we'll continue on. We'll keep on going through. Uh, so before running any meaningful multi-level model, you need to check nestedness. Uh, some some journals, depending on your discipline, they will require intra-class correlation coefficient at least be discussed. Because uh, it's essentially capturing, well, how nested is your data set? Um, so within this, I, I mean, if you have really low nestedness, I mean, just use an OLS potentially, again, depending on what camp you're in. Um, but what we start is we actually have to start running a multi-level model before, so we can actually test if we need to use multi-level modeling. This is what's called an intercept-only model. So an intercept-only model indicates it's just the intercept in the model. There's no independent variables in the model. And so we essentially just have a one by, we have a grouping variable of our level two to have a random effect for that. And then there's going to be a slope and then no other variables. So this is what I like to call a null model or sometimes called an intercept-only. So what we do is we're going to use LME4. Um, if you're using longitudinal data, there's going to be a whole bunch of different things to do with that. But for cross-sectional, this is the basic structure. There is another package called NLME that offers different aspects compared to MLE4 for multi-level modeling. I like MLE4 personally, uh, but it's all pre personal preference, really. Uh, so for the basic structure, so we're going to use the LMER function, and then we have our formula, our equation. For an intercept only, we have our outcome variable regressed on, or tilde, one, and that's going to signify an intercept. Now, when we add predictors, we don't have to have this one in there. It's going to automatically do that. But for an intercept only, we have to designate something in the equation. And now we have our nestedness. So we have, this is a one vertical bar class. This is signifying that there's a random effect. There's a random, there's a slope, that the variable to the right of that is the grouping variable. That's what students are being nested on. We're saying our data set, and we're just going to exclude missingness. Um, from there, we can get our summary statistic. And then I also like using 
uh, deviance information criteria to, for model comparisons later on. Uh, it's a good way to determine well which one has the least li uh, misfit essentially. So looking at this, and we can actually do one statistical test for different models too later on. This is just a null model saying, okay, hey, there's there's an intercept, great. Um, but this also lets us know how many observations we have, how many groups we have. So this is a good quick check to make sure, okay, we should have 100 classes and a total of 2,000 observations. That looks good. Now, we're not going to really interpret the null model, or the intercept only. We could look at the coefficients, and this is based on for each, each 100 classes. So we have our intercepts, because again, we have that random effect within this. We can also look at the classroom intercepts, like a histogram of these. Um, one thing I want to mention too within this is we have our random effect here. We have our class with our intercept. We also have our residual. These are we're going to actually save this later on then to calculate some things, especially like effect sizes. So now that we have a null model, essentially just a intercept only model, we can now calculate an intraclass correlation coefficient or ICC. Uh, this is a way to really calculate the degree of nestedness. So it's a proportion of variance in the outcome that occurs between groups versus the total variance present. Um, so it can range from zero, no variance among clusters, to one, meaning there's no variance within clusters. So it kind of depends. Now, we can't take this as an R-squared, though. We can't take that interpretation. In fact, there are no good benchmarks of, hey, we need an ICC of like 0.4 for multi-level. There's, there's no good benchmarks based on simulation work. Um, so what we do is we take this, we can actually do some further stuff with it. So for the ICC, we take the proportion of the variance across clusters divided by the variance across clusters plus the variance within. So we have our ICC, our tau zero zero, divided by tau zero zero plus our sigma squared within this. So like I said, there's no benchmarks. Uh, some people will kind of look at that and say, ah, that's like a 0.35, yeah, I should probably use multi-level. Um, that's really subjective. There's no good cutoffs. Um, so there is that. Um, you can do that. There's a done the way I'm going to show you in a minute called design effect, um, which works great for cross-sectional data. But the idea is that, I mean, you want to report ICCs. Uh, you can't really interpret it a whole lot outside of that. And there's, again, no benchmarks. What you can do, though, is you can take what's called a design effect. And this is trying to quantify that violation of independence on the standard errors of the estimates. So it's an estimate multiplier. It needs to apply to standard errors to correct for that negative bias of having nested data. Uh, Pug 2010's paper is fantastic primer. And that's where this is coming from. So the design effect is simply 1 plus the average number of responses within the cluster minus 1 multiplied by our ICC. If you have a design effect greater than two, then multi-level modeling should be utilized. This is based on simulation work back in the 90s from Muthin and Muthin. So if you're familiar with M+, or do a lot with uh, latent variable modeling, uh, the name Muthin should be ringing all sorts of bells now. Uh, so that it's this is a really, really good method to really have a a nice cutoff or decision point of, do I need to use multi-level modeling? So we can calculate that. So we can actually take our variance. So we have our model that we stored. We're getting our variance and covariance and storing that as a data frame for random effects. And now we have a little data frame. Now that we can we have our variance covariance, we can actually then take our random effects. And now we're just plugging and play this to get the ICC between. And our ICC is 0.36. So it's rounding about 0.37. Um, you can do this, but if you have a complex model, it, it can get a little tricky. So I mean, this typically works, but I actually recommend using a function. That way you're not having to plug and play this a lot. So just use performance ICC, and that'll calculate it for you. It gives you adjusted and unadjusted. And I mean, with rounding, it's the same thing. So based on this, I'm like, okay, uh, 0.3, I'm just going to call this a 0.37. 0.36 for ICC. Let's then calculate design effect. Easiest way to do this is use the hmisc package. It has a built-in function that automatically calculates that your row, which is going to be your ICC, is going to give you your sample size and your number of clusters. So a lot of information as a quick check. 
Again, Rho with founding, it's roughly the same. We have a design effect of 7.9. That is a large design effect. So yeah, we should definitely use multi-level modeling here. If you want to do this by hand, we need to know what's the average number of students per cluster. We have to have our ICC between. That's why we saved that. And we can calculate that here, design effect, with rounding, same thing. And then here's a different way of doing it. Again, slight differences based on what you're inputting in there, but it's all saying above two. So with this, we should really be using multi-level modeling. So now that we've determined, okay, so we have to use multi-level modeling, well, what do we do now? There's different ways of doing this. I'm gonna show you the technique that I like, and this is, I wanna say exploratory, but it's, it's building up a different argument. If you wanna throw all your predictors in your model, you can definitely do that as well. You can definitely do that. I see that done a lot. What I like to do is I like to do what's called a model building technique. So what we do is um, I add in independent variables sequentially in blocks of predictors. And then I get the deviant score for each model, which is essentially, that's the maximum likelihood procedure, um, how well the model fits the data, and it's a log likelihood test of the current model minus the saturated, the lower deviance, the better model fit. And then we can actually do some tests within that. So I can, I like to see like, well, when I start adding variables in the model, is that improving my model fit? Almost like a blocked regression, so to speak. Um, the benefit of that is, well, let's say that later on you run into convergence issues. If you're using this model sequential, this small building design, then you have a, a pretty good idea what variable is, is causing the issue. If you throw it all in at once, you have to do a little bit more detective work to figure out, okay, well, what's that variable that's causing the issue? Um, so it, it kind of all depends on the different frameworks um, and just kind of whichever one you kind of feel most comfortable with. But let's go ahead and start with what we're calling our model one. This is our model with our first predictor. It's a level two independent variables of extraversion and sex. So actually I'm adding two variables in there. And first let's go ahead and take a quick look at it, ignoring multi-level structure, just to see what this looks like. So we see uh, sex here and we're seeing, okay, there are differences here. I mean, the lines are pretty, pretty parallel. Um, so let's go ahead and to run this. Now I went ahead and I left the intercept in there. You don't have to do that. It will automatically add it in there, just out of practice, just to kind of show that model building, just as we're adding different variables, I do that. So we have our sex, extra version, we're keeping our nesting variable in there too, getting our summary and our deviance. We run that and it converged, double check it. Yep, so it converged, we're good there. Um, if you want to conversions issues, just because it says it didn't converge, doesn't necessarily mean it's an issue. There's different levels and different types of convergence issues. Um, if you run into that, send me an email, let me know. I have like the sandbox code I'm happy to share that works through all the different things you can do to change the optimizers and to try to fix the convergence issues and like kind of reset the iterations and all. But looking at this, we have our random effects, we have our class, and we have our residuals left over. We have our fixed effects. Um, let me go ahead and fix something really quick, because I, let's see, um, options. Sidepen equals. Okay, let me try that again. There we go. Um, I, I don't like scientific notation. It It's too much for my brain at times, especially if I haven't had a lot of coffee. So I like to turn off scientific notation. Um, it just makes it easier for me to read it. So we have our scaled residuals. We have our fixed effects. And we can also see that the... the a still significant test within those. Um, a quick pause on this. Um, so for LME4, technically it does not give you p-values. So I kind of didn't mention this, but there is some code up here where we're getting LME4, LMER test, and that gives you a, a pseudo p-value for these coefficients. For theoretical, or for 
theoretical reasons, they did not add in the p-values within this because there's issues with calculating the p-values for multi-level data. So it, these are kind of pseudo p-values. Um, so kind of interpret with caution. Um, so if you ran this without LMER test, you're not going to get p-values. Um, so it's something to consider within that. Um, so I'm just trying to find my place. Ah, too far, too far. Okay, so we have, we ran a model. And we can see, okay, looking at this, sex dummy coded is just a significant extroversion. The fixed effect is significant. And we can see that um, there is that um, increase in the estimate. Where that's our unstandardized coefficient for each unit increase. We're going from uh, zero to a one. There's that increase. So what we can then do is now that because we have our deviance criteria right here, that's our essentially lower score is better fit. We can actually run a, uh, this is from Gelman and Hill, 2007, another fantastic book. We can actually use deviance scores to compare the null model with a independent one with independent variables and the deviance scores can be used as a chi-square test. So are, is there a significant improvement so we're using uh, with maximum likelihood rather than our LML or restricted maximum likelihood and saying, okay, is there a significant difference between the models? Looking at this, our model with extroversion and sex that had a significant lower deviance score. So it had better model fit compared to our intercept only model or our null model. So we can feel pretty confident model one is a better model. And we would do that for each and every model. Uh, we can also look at the coefficients and extract those. This is for all the 100 classrooms. Notice how we have differences in the intercept. That's our first column. But for sex and extroversion, those are fixed effects. So every class is getting the same effect for that. For that. So just keep that in mind. We can also look at this as a better way, just the fixed effects within this and extract that for reporting. Um, when you're reporting multi-level model, you intend to report the fixed effects. Um, you really don't have a table with all the random effects in there, though. Um, if you want to extract them to look at, you can most definitely can do that, and extracting them is super easy. So what we're going to do now is we can go ahead and look at the standard errors as well for both of these, just to kind of get a sense of what's going on there. Again, exploring the data set more than you'd probably report in, the or in a write-up. What we do now is a level two, which is now we have a second level predictor of teacher experience. Now here we just have it within our equation. We're not subdividing level one, level two predictors within the equation. We're just plugging it right in and then going with it. So we don't have to do anything special with level two predictors. As long as they're in the model, because they're a constant for each classroom, R knows that it's a level two predictor. So looking at this, we can see Okay, a teacher experience that is statistically significant as well. We'd want to interpret the coefficient and kind of see what's going on there as well. We can look at our correlation of fixed effects. If you wanted to add a random slope for variables, uh, so if we wanted to add a random slope for sex and extroversion and allow that information in there, we can definitely do that by just adding the variables to the left of the vertical bar when we do the nesting. And notice here, it failed to converge. Okay, so this, I would then want to figure out, okay, there's the tolerance issue in component one. So I would want to explore this convergence issue and figure, okay, well, why was that issue there? What was going on? Um, also, sometimes if you have a really complex model, it, sometimes it can fail to converge because of the complexity within this. So I'd want to go through and I would explore different things before I give up on the model. Um, for, for time, though, we're going to go ahead and uh, put a pin in that. But, but looking at the random slope for sex, that was not statistically significant. So then what we'd probably want to do is we do model trimming. So then we would then have a model four and we would start omitting things. We were omitting the random slope for sex. And I think that was actually likely the issue with convergence because of that variable. When we look at it, it converts. So yeah, actually, I'm pretty confident now that there's an issue when we add sex as a random effect within this model. We can then go ahead and look at it. We do the interpretations as normal, regular coefficients. 
Uh, but the fun thing here is we can also do cross-level interaction. So let's say we wanted to look at, well, within our model, controlling all other variables, is there an interaction between a teacher's experience in years and the level of extroversion for popularity? So is that, let's say use that relationship between extroversion and popularity explained by teacher experience. So we would have a teacher experience as a moderator in this. So we'd be able to create an, an interaction term and then visualize this. So to create that interaction term, we're just simply putting extroversion colon TEXP. And we have that here. We also have the variables in the model here too. But by doing this, this is going to go ahead and create an interaction term. Uh, we might want to go ahead and center this potentially. Um, but again, for this, we're skipping centering. Looking at this, we do have a significant interaction term. So now we'd want to probe that interaction. Okay, well, what's going on there for interpretations? Uh, also, we're going to go ahead and run a quick chi-squared test to see, okay, model fit. Is it better? We can also obtain the coefficients, just like we did before. So we get, if you want to get that, the individual, or the classroom level, the intercepts, and then the fixed effects, we can do that. Again, we do have extra, let's see, we have our extroversion as a random effect. So that's why we have some variation between at the level two. Um, it's going to skip the head really quick because we've already talked about some of this. But we can then go ahead and bind all this into a table. Now I have a nice coefficient table. Again, it's 100 rows. We wouldn't put that in manuscript, though. But we had that significant interaction term. So let's go ahead and figure out, okay, well, what's going on here? So it's really important to visualize your interactions because otherwise it's really hard to interpret them. So what I do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put this in. And now I can see, okay, so we have each of the different, or each year of teacher experience, what that looks like. So as we have, get higher more and more teacher experience, and then if extroversion goes up too, we can kind of see, well, what does, what does that look like? What is that, what are we seeing there? Um, so we could leave it this way and look at each year. We could also then potentially try to chunk this into different like year groups. I always recommend caution because if we take a continuous variable and start dichotomizing or grouping it, but then we're treating things that um, like let's say four and five are in different groups, like one, two, three, and then four, five, or one, two, three, sorry, two, three, four, then five, six, seven, let's say those two separate groups. But let's say four and five are really close, we're treating them as different, that's an issue. So I'm not a big fan of dichotomization, but it, I've, it's done a lot though. Um, so we can then start exploring what that interaction looks like, what's going on with teacher experience. Um, if you want to visualize random effects, um, I have never seen this done in paper. I have never personally done this in a paper, uh, but it's something you can do. So we have a little new function here for a caterpillar, and we can essentially look at a caterpillar plot of our random effects. Um, again, it's, I haven't really seen it reported. Uh, similar thing in Lattice, again, the same thing. We can kind of see what's, what's going on there for our random effects. Um, more, more importantly, though, is effect size and multi-level modeling. This gets really, really tricky, um, especially if we move past a continuous outcome variable to like um, a generalized mixed effects model or a generalized multi-level model. It gets even trickier. Um, there's really no good R squared even for continuous multi-level modeling. So we have analogs instead. So what we do is we can take the variance account for the by dependent variable at each level done separately. So that's one method. Uh, second one is much more common called proportion reduction and variance. Uh, so this we're estimating the variance explained by any variance component in the model compared to the baseline. So as it's comparison from one to another, that statistic can't be interpreted as an absolute variance accounted for, like an R squared. We can't do that. Um, so it's much more common to see proportion reduction than it is an R-squared analog. Um, that being said, more recently, I have seen more R-squared analogs be mentioned, but most commonly, you're still going to see proportion reduction. Again, when you do in your multi-level models, look at how your discipline is handling multi-levels, how it's being reported, and use that. Um, if you want to 
let's say that your discipline isn't using R squared analogs and you want to use it, go for it, go for it. But be prepared that you're going to have to do some explaining and it's going to be an uphill battle. But be that pioneer, just do that. I trailblaze that and then go for it. Um, but it is going to be a little bit more work. So that's why I always recommend, look at what your discipline's doing, see what makes the most sense. And if you're really, really passionate about using this new technique or a newer technique, go for it, but be prepared. Um, so something just consider with them. That just, again, being really pragmatic about this. I love R squared analogs, but I also still report production or proportion reduction and variance as well, though, uh, just to re to appease all the reviewers. So the first one we have is looking at the R squared level one. So we have our sigma squared for model one, tau squared model one, and then we have our null model, our intercept only. So we can calculate that as an R squared for level one. Then we can also take our variant level variance calculated for the level two but we need to calculate an, an account for the average number of responses within the clusters, just like we did ICCs. So we have a similar equation, but now we're accounting for, well, how many, what's our average within each cluster to account for that level two. So we have a proportion for level one, proportion to level two. Um, these are really, these are really similar equations, or they are the same ones as, as uh, Snedger and Busker 2012 as uh, Laurel in 2018. We can then extract using our variance covariance matrix within this, and then essentially creating, getting our previous random effects. That's a quick refresh because we restored or had stored this, and then essentially creating that equation. You can do that, and now we get our level one. Same thing, we plug and play our equation for our level two, and you can do that. Um, honestly, though, you can do that by hand, but there's a, this is 2019, so fair, it's not exactly as recent, but there's a, uh, what's called a middle package. So you can actually request the different variations of this. So it uses the same equations as what we did before, uh, as well as the total variance or SB based on, as, as well as a multivariate variance. So it's different ways of partitioning the variances. So we can request all of these and we can kind of scroll up like, okay, three, seven, Within around, so it's, I mean, it's a little bit close. Uh, it could also be an issue with me kind of calculating there. Our SB, we have a level one. Let's see our SB, total variance accounted for by Snyders and Bosker. So we can kind of see this as a different way of doing it as well. This only works for continuous variables though. Um, there's also R2 MLM. This is a different approach. We just plug in our model. We get our different variations here too. We have our fixed, our slope variation mean, and our sigma for decompositions, as well as our corresponding R squares. And we can kind of see, okay, well, a quick visual of the decomposition of proportion of variance explained. Uh, question. Oh, good, good. So glad to hear this is helpful. Awesome. Um, and let me know if you have any questions too. Great. Um, so the... The thing I want to mention, though, with the analogs is that it's not as commonly utilized. I mean, times are changing within this. I'd still recommend proportion of variances, though. Um, the Zhu uh, 2013, there's another variation. I mean, there's tons of different variations of R squares. So you have to mention what one you're using specifically and be prepared to have a citation. Uh, so this is another variation, uh, more, more for mixed models. Uh, but it takes the full model residual variance and the variance of the null model residual. And we can get our, what's called the, the Jus R squared. So think of it as the, uh, Jus, I think, I'm, I think I mispronounced the Hughes name, last name, unfortunately, my apologies. Uh, but it's similar to an R squared for a regular regression. It doesn't break down the level one, level two, which I think is a little bit problematic. So I, I don't know I would recommend this as much. But again, this is an overall R squared. Um, so, but if you wanted to use proportion reduction, you would then calculate for any variance component within your model at your level one and your level two variances. So you have your sigma baseline, your sigma with your, for the variable, then the baseline for the fitted. So the sigma squared F, that's for your fitted model. We can then plug and play this and calculate the variance is gonna be a reduction for the residual. 
we can then do our level two for each inter the intercepts and the slopes. So you then calculate a whole bunch of these variance, portion variance reductions. Uh, it's a little bit more tedious to do, but then we can start calculating that. Um, portion reduction, it doesn't behave like R squared though, because you're comparing one model to another rather than the amount of variance explained by the dependent variable. So just when you're, when you're reporting this, just use caution, don't, don't give in. Don't don't try to use it as a portion of variance accounted for. Resist that urge because uh, it's, it's not going to be correct. Um, so because my research, I mostly like I my work is really closely related to educational psychology, even though I'm an experimental psychologist by training. Um, I love standardized beta weights. I love them. It's for me. It's like how I report stuff. I love it. Um, you can do this quite easily. You don't have to standardize your data beforehand. If you want to, you can, but the easiest thing is just take your model that you're going to retain, and from the Muman package, there's a standardized coefficient. And then we can get the standardized, again, intercept's going to drop out because it's standardized, but we have, for each standard deviation increase in extraversion, there is a 0.4 or a standard deviation increase in popularity, holding all other variables constant as a fixed effect. We can interpret those. Uh, we can also create a unstandardized coefficient table, and we can support these out of R. So if you if you like if you like me and like standardized coefficients, then here's a quick way to, to do that without having to do a whole lot of things to your data set. Um, as with any analysis, check your assumptions though. We've, we've been having fun running stuff, but not running assumption checks. So you want to check your residuals of your model to ensure your residuals are normally distributed at both levels, not just one level or the other level. Um, so we want to check for heteroscedasticity. I'm going to use model five here. And see, okay, that looks pretty, that looks pretty good. We want to check for the normality of our residuals as well. So we would just go through and just check this one at a time. Uh, we also want to check the normality of random effects of introversion and our intercept for for classrooms and see, okay, yeah, that looks pretty normal. That looks pretty, pretty good. And then for extroversion, same thing. Quick visual check, that looks good. Um, what we can also do is the performance package has a bunch of built-in features, and these work for multi-level models as well. So we can check for collinearity, heteroscedasticity, normality, and check for outliers. We can run all of those. And it gives us little checks within this. So if I go back down here for multicollinearity, we have low. We have some moderate. Now, the moderate here is I would not worry about this because you have an interaction term. So because we have an interaction term as well as the original variables in the model, then, yeah, I would expect a collinearity because we have an interaction term. So if you have interaction terms, grain of salt with the with the collinearity test. I just want to mention that really quick. It also gives you a quick check, a check to see do the area variances, do they appear homoscedastis, which you want. Uh, residuals, do they appear normally distributed and no outliers. And it gives you based on those criteria. So I'll do the visual checks and then these kind of to back it up as well. And so far, I feel pretty confident with the assumption checks. Now, this is all well and good. But now that you've had, now you spent some time running stuff, now it's time to actually report it. So this is from an excerpt from Coach, I'm a coach uh, 2010. Uh, McCoach is over at Bethany McCoach, uh, University of Connecticut, uh, my alma mater from undergrad. Uh, so this is a checklist, and this is actually from Greg Hancock's, it's um it's the reviewer's guide, the quantitative reviewer's guide. It's the library has a copy of it. It is fantastic. Each chapter is written by an expert in an analysis that has what as a reviewer, what's the checklist of things that you would expect to see? And it goes into detail with each section. So it is a phenomenal, phenomenal desk reference. Um it, this is a little bit older, so it, it might need to be updated a bit, but it's it's a fantastic resource. So the big things is you want to have model theory and variables in your model that's consistent with the study and the research questions. Again, having alignment. Every study, your variables and your questions, if there's no alignment, well, you, you got issues right from the get-go. 
Um, if you're deciding whether to include or exclude random effects, you have to justify that theoretically. It just can't be because, well, it's better model fit. So you always want to make sure that you address that from a theoretical perspective. Let theory drive the bus, so to speak. Um, the number of random effects, they should be realistic. Uh, so if you're removing things from model building, if you're doing that model building technique, explain, well, why you're dropping it. What makes sense with them? So what are you seeing? Uh, statistical model present, uh, so using equations. So this is a big recommendation. Every multi-level paper I see within my discipline, you write out the equation. And it is super helpful because then you can take that and get a sense of, well, how are you structuring the data? How are you thinking about the data? And then, because sometimes if you see an issue with the equation, but then how to report it, if there's a difference there, then you know something's up. But it's always good to report that. Um, sample size justifications. Uh, this gets tricky. I mean, you can do multi-level modeling power analysis. Um, it just gets kind of tricky within it. It's, it's more simulation based, but you want to think about what's your sampling strategy? How are you ensuring that you have enough responses at your individual level as well as your cluster level? If you're using weighting strategies, you have to mention that as well too. Uh, measurement of outcome. Um, because my research is in psychometrics, I am obsessed with measurement completely. And I'm going to be adding uh, to the longitudinal multilevel modeling uh, about uh, reliability coefficients, uh, looking at it at the level one, level two. So I'll be adding that soon. That's some really fun stuff. But just thinking about your measurement, how is your outcome described and justified? How are you explaining the how your variables are measured? Are they reliable and valid? Um, so you always want to have that too. If you're scaling or centering your variables, you want to bring that back to your research questions. Um, if you're coding predictors, like dummy coding, explain what the dummy coding is and making sure that the interpretations make sense within that. Uh, if you have missing data, make sure you mention that at all levels. So you level on level two. Um, there's, I remember seeing some information like, oh, well, if you have missing data, just throw a multi-level at it and it's not a big issue. And it's not quite, doesn't quite work that way. Um, so you want to, like with an R, it just drops missing characters within this, uh, missing responses. So if you have missing data, depending on the nature of the missingness, I would highly recommend imputation strategies. Like um, there's maximum likelihood. There's also um, full information, maximum likelihood, multiple imputation, some different ways of handling those. Um, if you're doing longitudinal multi-level, because uh, this chapter from a coach was both cross-sectional and longitudinal, um, if you do longitudinal models, the shape of the growth trajectory and making sure that you describe that. And then the software. Um, this is a common oversight. Always mention the specific programs because um, if you're using R by default, uses R restricted maximum likelihood. That's slightly different than regular maximum likelihood. So that's going to actually change your parameter estimations. So you want to make sure that you're being consistent when you're running your models, that it, they're not interchangeable within that. And then the assumptions that you, you kind of those check boxes that you went through all of those. And then uh, the, the error covariances, this is more for longitudinal. Like, is it, what, what does that structure look like? And then descriptive statistics. Um, I mean, with a hundred clusters, that'd be really challenging to do, but Think of a way to maybe try to summarize that really quickly or as an appendix or maybe supplemental. Um, ICC should always be added. I'd actually take this a step further and say design effect should be added for cross-sectional. Uh, just because I love that design effect, I think it's a better measure than ICC because you're also accounting for how many cases within clusters on average. Um, and then the multi-level models built sequentially, you always wanna make sure you kind of start with unconditional and then build in complexity. And then you want to kind of explain that. Um, the write-ups and having sure you have a fixed effects table and the variance components, so you don't report the random effects. Just for each cluster, you don't do that. That's not common. But you want to make sure you have the variance components and your fixed effects. And then model fit, like ICC, BIC. I prefer deviance because I use that from a, a, a Gelman and Hell framework. Oh, fantastic. Um, great to hear that this was helpful. Uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Um, and we'll do a longitudinal one too in the near future. And always happy to share any code and, and help out with the stuff. So let me know.
So because tables are so critical for multi-level, and I like the idea of automating stuff because I, I spent way too much time in Excel trying to make this, um, here's a quick way to take our different models we created and have R spit out something nice. So what we first do is we create a list. And each within the list, we're creating models for our null model all the way up to our model file, which is our final model. We're just storing all that into essentially a, an object or as a list. And now what we can do is we can use what's called M summary to create an HTML table and denote statistical significance. I don't like statistical significance, but got to report it. Um, unless you're doing Bayesian, a uh, whole nother stuff. Uh, but we do this and then we get a nice little, let me go ahead and fix this. So that's not as great. Um, when we do, when you knit it and have render this into an HTML, it looks great. Uh, but for right now, it looks like complete garbage. Um, so if you're seeing this, don't worry about it. That's part for the course. Um, but the important thing is we can change the output within this to a doc file. So let me go ahead and run this. And then once that finishes running, now actually I'm gonna go ahead and have this render in the background. We'll give that a second. So we can kind of see both the HTML and the Word doc version. Give that a minute. Okay, maybe more than a minute. But while that's doing that, let me mention, um, couple citations and I'll circle back to the table. Uh, Gelman Hill, highly, highly recommend this book. Uh, it's really great information on regression and multi-level. They go into um, generalized as well. There's a newer book that's called Regression and Other Stories. That's a really good one to look at too. A um, bunch of other resources than a coach one. That's from the, oh, the Reviewer's Guide to Quantitative Methods in Social Sciences. That's a fantastic book. Um, the library has a copy of it. And then there's a bunch of different articles here as well, and then resources in the Lima class. Okay, so now that we have our, oh, there we go. So we have our little document from today, all that fun stuff we've done. Let me scroll down all the way to the bottom. All the way, this is why you don't export like random effects for each individual, because it's just nonsense. All right, so here is our little table we have as an HTML. So we can see our different models. We have our various components for each of the different things within this, or correlations. We have our AIC, BIC, ICC for each model, a number of observations in there. But when we run it, we can also get, in our working directory, we get it as a Word doc. The nice thing with this Word doc is we can then customize this. I can change some of these labels, make it a little easier to read, but all the information is there. Like, I don't know if I'd report the R squared marginalized and conditional. I'd maybe, I'd probably report either a pseudo R squareds instead from the different calculations, or I'd use like proportion variance reduction personally. So even though we get this, I'd be like, <laughs> I don't know. So I would then customize this to my needs within a paper. But it has the heavy lifting rather than having to essentially write down all of these and put this into a document. Um, again, I'm a big phone at work, smarter, not harder. Um, but again, this was just a, an introduction to cross-sectional multi-level modeling. It's We could definitely spend hours talking about it, if not a whole semester. It's a fantastic analysis. And then it, it's a really good tool for the toolbox. Um, let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen. But that being said, I do want to mention that sometimes you run into convergence issues. Uh, there's different techniques you can use. I, I throw Bayesian at it if I can't get it to work right. But I also like Bayesian because then you can put in your beliefs about the model and it gives you a different way of doing this. Um, but I'm not going to push you base. If you run into conversions issues, let me know. I have some scripts that run through stuff and try different things. Because sometimes it's just an optimizer changing the iterations. Um, but I hope this was helpful. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, there's also an evaluation link into the chat. If there's other topics that you're interested in, because um, I'm already kind of thinking through what are some workshops to do in the fall? Because uh, I have my my list of, of workshops I always love to do. 
but just because I love to do like IRT models and stuff like that doesn't mean that's going to be as helpful for you all for your research. So if there's specific um, workshop topics that you would really love to hear, to, to learn or to do, let me know and happy to do it. Oh, so glad to hear the script was helpful. Uh, by all means, take it, run with it, adapt it. Um, if you're doing more longitudinal type work, again, there's going to be the workshop in, um, in the near future. And I think it's, a I want to say in March, I think, um, same idea, but purely longitudinal uh, daily diary stuff, happy to share the code and stuff I have, um, big proponent of open coding, open data. So if I have script, happy to share it with you. And if you have specific questions, uh, please, please, please feel free to reach out to me. I love talking about this stuff and, um, if there's things I can do to help with your research, if you have questions or analyses or even just kind of thinking through the code, let me know. Always happy to do that. Let me go ahead and put my 